Good morning, Radiant Church. Love you guys. Love the energy in here. A lively bunch of Jesus freaks in here. Am I right? Come on now. It's good. Hey, awesome to be with you. My name is John. I'm the campus pastor here at Richland. Uh, also infamously known as the holiday pastor. So I was trying to figure out, is this the holiday weekend? Because the fourth is on a Wednesday or is next weekend the holiday? But then I remembered, I'm speaking both weekends. So all is safe in the holiday <laughs> world and it's awesome to be with you and Pastor Lee is on vacation uh, for a few weeks. He's going to be back when um, Rita Springer's here and Jared Anderson's here so make sure you're here and maybe even more importantly bring somebody with you. It's, uh, the whole purpose is to have more people experience the presence of God here at Radiant so we're super excited about that. A couple things before we get started. Number one I just want to tell you because I know you've been losing sleep over it but the Zondervans have officially moved into a home. Thank you. Yes. So thank you for your prayers during this transition. Uh, we moved on Friday because I only move on days when it's 175 <laughs> degrees. And so to my friends who helped me move, thank you. I did provide chili and hot chocolate for everyone though. <laughs> so <laughs> we could stay hydrated. Anyway, we're super excited to be back there. Also, um, uh, you may or may not know Pastor Andrew who was up here, heads our youth ministry, and they just came back, a group of young people from a trip to the Bold Conference with David Perkins in Kansas City, and I just want to be the first to tell you guys that there was some serious God encounters that happened in the lives of those young people. I'm sure you're going to hear more about it, but I just want you to know that not like, hey, we kind of had a good time, but like God imparting gifts of the Spirit on kids, praying and prophesying over each other, kids, young people being radically impacted by the presence of God. So I'm here to tell you, yes, revival is starting in this generation at Radiant Church. So come on, let's give the Lord praise in this place. It's, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. So could not be more thrilled. There was 41 spontaneous baptisms that just took place. And, and I want to just honor Pastor Andrew and Pastor Zach and Pastor Brandon in Portage who did an incredible job, not just facilitating it, but pastoring the young people through some of these encounters and experiences. Uh, it's, it's the real deal, and, and so are they as leaders. So I love them. And, and speaking of baptisms, we are going to have baptisms after this service. There are 22 people in this service who are taking their next step to be identified with Jesus through water baptisms. Let's give them a huge hand. Amazing. So here's... Here's what that looks like for you. It's going to be taking place outdoors by the cafe, sort of on that patio. And what I would encourage you to do is after service, maybe about five minutes after, just stop by out there and just kind of gather around and, and help support them. And, and if you don't have to leave right away, maybe just be a part of, of their experience. And it's going to be super powerful. And, and there's two tanks out there, and we're just going to give God all the glory. And it's perfect weather for it, so enjoy. It's going to be amazing. So, yeah, we're excited. It's going to be awesome. Stick around for that. If you brought your Bibles, turn to the book of Daniel, and we're in a series called Heroes. So if you haven't been here for the summer, what we're doing is each week we're taking an Old Testament character or person, man or woman, who God used, raised up, to be used to advance the kingdom of God, to rescue, deliver many times his people, leaders, that God used normal people elevated to positions of authority and said, you're going to be used mightily in the kingdom. And what we're doing through this series is trying to make sure every believer knows that that's still what God is doing today. He's using his people to impact culture, to impact the world around us. And last week, Pastor Lee gave an amazing, amazing message on the life of Gideon in the book of Judges. And if you grew up in church, you're probably familiar with Gideon, the wine press, and, and the fleeces, and things like that. But if you didn't grow up in church, you don't have a church background, you might not know who Gideon is. But today, we are looking at Daniel. And almost everyone in America probably can think of something that they know about Daniel because he is in the Sunday School Hall of Fame, basically. How many of you grew up with felt board, Sunday school, yes, lions and things like, yeah, of course. Everybody understands that Daniel was a, an incredible, you know, character of the Old Testament because the first six chapters of the book of Daniel are just stock full of incredible stories, encounters, and miracles that God did through the life of Daniel. So we know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's the fiery furnace, you know, where the fourth man in the fire. Then there's handwriting where the finger of God literally shows up at a banquet and he writes words with just a hand and a finger on the wall in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. And then 
Most famously probably is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Yes, we all know that. Daniel refused to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. He was tricked, the king was, into passing a law that said if you worship any other God, you're going to be thrown in the den of lions. So he had to uh, stand by his new law, even though he didn't want to. And he put Daniel in the lion's den, and he was miraculously spared and not harmed. And the Bible tells us that an angel actually closed the mouth of the lions. But some scholars believe that the reason the lions were very passive and docile and refused to be aggressive is because they were Detroit lions. (laughs) Ah, sorry. Sorry, this has not gone over well in any service. (laughs) I mean, Super Bowl, this is our year. Come back to me. Okay, sorry. Sorry. It was a miracle. It really was an angel. Just like when they win the Super Bowl. It's going to be a miracle this year, maybe. Okay, so here's how you know. I'm just going to give you a quick, quick background. This is how you know you've reached Bible character infamy as Daniel has. You have a book named after you, Daniel, but others... You know, Joshua, Ruth, Esther, they have books. But he has a fast named after him, right? Daniel fast, how many of you have ever done a Daniel fast? Only fruits, vegetables, okay, 11 of us, that's good. Um, I was thinking about what if they named a fast after me and all you ate was Nutella and it was like (laughs) biblical, but that's probably not that impactful. But then you have Rack Shack and Benny who are moguls of the veggie tales. So Daniel made it there. How many of your kids have watched Rack Shack and Benny and how many adults can't get it out of your head? Yes, okay. Few of us. And lastly, little known fact about Daniel is he was mentioned in Reverend Brown's sermon in Coming to America. Anyone know what I'm talking about? You need to trust the Lord because it helped Joshua fight the battle at Jericho and it helped Daniel get out the lion's den and it helped Gilligan get off the island. Anybody remember that? No? Okay. I promised my wife I wouldn't do that, but I did. So it's good. It's good. Be sure to tip your waitress. I'll be here all week. Okay. Seriously though, we're in Daniel. I promise you it's going to get biblical. What I want you to remember more than just the Bible stories, more than just the, the, the incredible things that stand out in that book is what we're going to talk about that Daniel needs to be remembered and honored for is this. Daniel stood firm in his faith, firm in his conviction and dedication to God in the midst of a culture where it was increasingly difficult. Daniel was besieged with Israel, taken captive and raised in Babylonian culture as a young man. And it was wicked and it was full of pagan gods, sexual immorality, everything you can think of in a dark culture. And Daniel not only survived, Daniel thrived in this culture. Daniel was able to be an influencer in culture, even though it was dark, and even though it was going in a direction that was opposite. The current was pulling him away from God. And I think many of us in this room can identify with the challenge that Daniel had. We're we're Christians. We want to serve Jesus. We want our lives to reflect Jesus, but we're in a culture where it is increasingly difficult to follow God. There is increasing pressure on us to conform to culture, to not be too outspoken, to not dig our heels in per se, or if if you believe this, then that means that, or you're a bigot, or you're a whatever. There's so much pressure on Christians. And And I don't think we're bad people. We're just honestly like, how do we navigate culture and a way where we stand true and stay true to God, but we're also not hating people. I mean, what does that look like for us as Christians? And that's what Daniel did. And that's what we're going to look at. So in Daniel chapter one, I want you to read along with me. We'll get a little background to this. It says in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, Babylon is modern day Iraq, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasures of the house of his God. Here's what happened, and it's generationally what happened many times in the history of Israel is they rejected God. They turned their back on God as his people. And when they did, there was a price to pay. There were consequences that were involved. Every culture and every nation that has turned their back on God has paid a price and there has been consequences. And the Bible says they were besieged. They were exiled. They were taken captive. 
Not only them, but all the things in the temple that should have been in the house of God are now in the house of Babylonian gods. And I believe the United States of America is at a crossroads in many ways in culture. We're one of those nations. Are we going to be one nation under God, as it says? Or which direction are we going to be pulled? Where are we going to be as a people, as a nation? And that's exactly what happened to Israel. And then it says, so then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. So Ashpenaz is the leader. He's second in command to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king says to him, I want you, everybody's our slaves, all of Israel. But some of them are going to go do manual labor. Some of them are going to put out in, in, in the fields. But some of them, the smart ones, the ones from noble background, the educated ones, you're going to bring into the courts of the king. And we're going to train them. And we're going to indoctrinate them. And we're going to make them influencers of our culture. And so this is what he says in verse 4. So they, they got young people. They got young men without any physical defect. Handsome. Showing aptitude for every kind of learning. Sounds like a campus pastor, doesn't it, to you guys? Just kidding. Don't laugh too hard. Okay. Uh, quick to understand. Qualified to serve in the king's palace. And look at this. And he, Ashpenaz, was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. That was his job. You're going to take our culture, our dark culture, and you're going to cause it to influence these young men, these educated people, and we're going to get them to operate on our behalf. So the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, which might sound great. You know, hey, cool, they're going to eat like kings. But every single thing that they would have been asked to eat would have been sacrificed to an idol and would have broke every kosher dietary law that he would have known as a Jew. So this wasn't good news to him. And they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter into the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The situation Daniel is in is he's been captured. He's a young man. He grew up knowing God, loving God, and now he finds himself in Babylonian culture. He finds himself being brought before the wicked king and saying, now we're gonna train you and indoctrinate you and make you a part of who we are. And I feel like today, that's exactly how the enemy is trying to use culture in our society, in our world. Culture in itself isn't necessarily evil, but it's a, it's a tool the enemy is influencing so that there is a moral slide among people in general, even the people of God. And it's different. We're, we're generations removed from where everybody kind of went to church. And, and, and if someone was a Christian, that was a great thing. And, and they were respected. Now, Pastor Lee talked about it last week. You go to church, you're considered a, a zealot. You're considered a religious kind of you know, freak. And if you believe this about the Bible, then they're going to call you that. And there's a ton of pressure that's on Christians. How are we going to live? What are we going to do? How are we responding and that's where Daniel found himself, in a fight against culture, just like many of us are today as Christians. And so I want to give you a couple things about this battle. What do we need to know to be like Daniel and not just survive, but influence, thrive in the midst of culture? And the first thing is this, is understand the battle you're in is a spiritual battle. It's spiritual. And what I mean by that is, and I want you to hear this, people are not the enemy. Say people are not the enemy. People aren't the enemy. People are the prize that we're fighting for. And what the enemy wants us to do is to, to, to camp out and to get behind our church walls or our Christian walls and say, they're the problem, they're the problem. We're at war with Muslims, we're at war with atheists, we're at war with the homosexuals, we're at war with whoever. And they're against us and they're not for us, so we're in this battle with them. Paul said in Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle or struggle against flesh and blood. People are not the problem. Instead, it's rulers and authorities and powers of the dark world and spiritual forces. Everything about the battle that's happening in culture is a spiritual battle. People are not the enemy, they're the prize. But the enemy wants, Satan wants us to be divided, wants us to be in division, wants us to be in discord. That is the arena that he thrives in. So he's loving this. 
political banter and the racial divides and the political divides and the economic divides. I don't know that in my lifetime I've ever seen our nation more divided. Obviously, the political part is, is a big part of it. Oh, you voted for him, then you're this. Oh, you voted for her, then you're that. One, one picture is, is Trump with horns and he's the devil and another one and he's hugging Jesus. And which is it? I mean, we, we, we are, it's people against people and social media has only exasperated it to fever pitch. If you ever wanna ruin a good day, just go on Twitter and read some of the responses to either someone who likes Trump or someone who doesn't. It's insane, it's terrible, and it's a strategic move of the enemy to get our minds and our hearts away from praying against the powers of darkness and making us mad at people. And Christians have to be different. We have to love people. They're not the problem, they're the prize. And I love what Jimmy Evans said when he was here. In, in, with, in person, we're gentle and lovable. When we're in our prayer closet, we are shouting at the devil and we are aggressive and we are mean. Mean in your prayer closet, nice to people. That's what we need to be because the world culture wants us to hate everybody. They really do. We can't have civil discord. We can't disagree. If you're not with me, you're against me. We have to be mad. It's why they put two lanes in drive throughs at McDonald's. They want you mad at that other person. It's like, I ordered first. I can't help it, I have three kids and they don't know what they want yet, you know? And now I'm mad at you. That's, that's what the world wants. I might not be biblical, but it's true. <laughs> Recognize the war you're in is a spiritual war. It's not people. Second thing is realize this. Culture wants to redefine who you are. Culture wants to change your identity. It's the first thing Satan wants you to do is to, wants to do is move you off of who you are in Christ and cause you to be influenced and to be identified by culture around us. And it is a strong battle. It's a strong battle. I don't care how strong of a Christian you are, you are going to be fighting for your identity in Christ because culture wants to say, no, no, this is who you are. This is what identifies you. This is what's going to fulfill you and make you happy. So we have young people, girls maybe in particular, who, who see themselves on Instagram and it's like, how many likes am I getting? I, I don't have the body that they have. I don't physically match up to these other people and my identity is built around that and now I'm shattered and I'm broken and I'm not as good and, and all of these fights for our identity. Young men growing up thinking that maybe sexual conquests are what make you a man or money or, or prestige or fame or power, authority. All of it twisted by culture. Listen to me. When culture shifts, not if, when culture shifts, you have to know who you are in Christ. You have to know who God says that you are because the battle is real and it's for our minds and it's for an entire generation wants to change our identity. My name is John Henry Zondervan. Maybe you didn't know that. I think Henry was my mom's great grandpa's name. Apparently John Henry was also a steel driving man. I didn't know that, but whatever. I can barely drive a car, much less steel, but that's my name. And then I have Zondervan, which carries its own kind of connotations. You know, people associate it with the Bible and publishing. So when I was in Bible school, I told people, yes, we wrote the Bible. <laughs> If you want my autograph, it's cool. I better get an A in this class, you know, so. Uh, but but I'm, I'm telling you, I didn't, I didn't grasp who I really was until later in life because in middle school and in high school, John Zondervan was so insecure. I was overweight. I didn't hit puberty until I was 27 years old. <laughs> Super late bloomer and I didn't fit in and I was so scared and, and, and I wanted people to like me and I wanted other kids to, to accept me and I, I felt like way below and behind where everybody else was, so I became something I wasn't. I became that kid who would do anything, the crazy kid who would say anything and drink anything and smoke anything and all through high school, that was my identity. And I let something else define me because I wanted so badly to fit in. I wanted so badly to belong. And God had to do something miraculous on March 14th, 1999. And I, and I had to have God speak to my identity. And God say, no, this is who you are. There's something so powerful about recognizing who you are in Christ. There's power in a name. There's power 
in the name. And look at, I don't have a lot of time to unpack it, but look what they did to, to these men. It says a king assigned them a, a, a daily amount of food and wine, but then in verse 7 it says the chief official gave them new names. The first thing that Ashpenaz did when he said, we're going to immerse you in culture, we're going to make you like us, he said, we're going to change your name, we're going to change your identity, we're going to change who you are. And Daniel, his name means God is my judge and my defender. That's what Daniel means. They changed his name to Belteshazzar, which means lady protect the king. They gave Daniel a girl name. And I'm telling you, you can research it for yourself. If you look at every single pagan culture in history, they all had gender confusion on some level. And do you know why that is? It's not to, to, to demonize a group of people or anything. It's because the enemy doesn't want you to just not know who God is. He doesn't even want you to know who you are. He wants confusion in every arena of your life because that's where he thrives. And they changed his name. And Hanani means God has been gracious. God has been good to me. The Bible says, God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. No matter where you go or where you've been, I am always for you. They changed his name to Shadrach, which means I am fearful. I'm fearful. You can't trust God. He's not for you. He's not always good. Mishael means this, his name. Who is like my God? This confident statement. There's no other God that's like my God. My God can move the mountains. My God is victorious. Who is like my God? They changed his name to Meshach, which means I am despised, contemptible, and ashamed. They marked them. They said, no, this is who you are. Azariah means God is for me. And they changed his name to Abednego, slave of Nebo. God is for me. I'm a child of God. This is who I, no, no, no. You're a slave to a Babylonian God, and that's your new name and your new identity. And if we aren't sure of who we are in Christ, the culture around us is going to say, this is who you are. You're a loser. You're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You'll never succeed. And the voice of the enemy wants to drown out the voice of the Lord. So when culture shifts, you have to know who you are in Christ. You have to. Third thing about the battle is this, is that you're going to be tested. You're going to be tested. They're going to want to know, are you really believing what you say you're believing? So they change his name in verse 8. It says this, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, but he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. I think it's interesting that he asked. He didn't yell. He didn't say, I'm not doing this. You Babylonians are the worst. You're all going to hell. This is your problem. He asked. He said, look, this is who I am. I have standards. I grew up differently. And look what it says. God caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. So, so Ashpen has liked him. But he told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. For why should he see you looking worse than the other young men? If that happened, the king would have my head. He says, look, I like you. I get it. I, I appreciate you saying something. But if you're skinnier or scrawnier than these other guys, I'm going to get killed. So I can't do it. And Daniel said this. Then Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. When you take a stand like Daniel did, he said, I don't want to defile myself. I still want to follow God. There's going to be a testing that takes place. And some of you are probably already feeling that in your workplace, in your families, where you go to school. People looking at you and saying, what do you believe? Which side are you on? Who are you for? And you're going to be tested. Faith is always tested. The Bible says actually in James to consider it joy when you go through trials for your for your faith, when there's testing of your faith, because then you know that it's being strengthened and your character is, is getting formed in a way that only God can do through some trials and through some testing. A faith that hasn't been tested really can't be trusted. So Daniel said, I, I, I'm gonna serve God, just test us. Let us do it God's way and see what happens. And for me, as a young man, again, I, I gave my heart to the Lord after a life of partying and, and drugs and alcohol at 24 years old, and I had to go back to a restaurant that I'd worked at, and I'd done all those things. And that was a test. 
for me because people looked at me and my friends looked at me and said, okay, great, whatever, John's a Christian, but are we going to the bar? Are we going to the strip club? Are we doing the things that we always used to do? And I'd love to be able to sit here and say it was easy for me to say, hearken unto thee, employees, I'm a Christian now. But it's hard. I get it. It's hard to go into work and be strong for the Lord. It's hard sometimes to, to pass these tests. And the reason that, that Daniel, there's these amazing stories of furnaces and of lion's dens is because he kept passing tests. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to serve Nebuchadnezzar. Well, then you're going to get thrown into a lion's den. Well, then you get thrown into a fiery furnace. Testings happen every season of Daniel's life, and they're going to happen to us as Christians. So ask the question, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to culture as it changes? How can we be like Daniel and not just survive but thrive in culture, influence the culture around us? And last week, Pastor Lee talked about Sometimes there's a temptation to be like Gideon and to just hide and just say, okay, we're just going to wait this out and hopefully the Lord will come again and I can thresh a little bit of wheat to get by, but hopefully nobody sees me. And we know that's not God's plan for his people. But I fear that there are responses the church is having to culture around us that are not beneficial and that are not helpful. And I want to talk about them. And I want to strike a balance as to how do we respond to culture so we can be like Daniel. The very first thing I think we do where we fall into a ditch is we have a dogmatic approach. We have this approach as Christians that says we're right and you're wrong and we have the Bible and you don't and we're living right and you're living wrong and that's your fault and that's your problem. And if you can't get it right and you end up going to hell, too bad for you. You're not listening, you're not getting it. You keep living that way, I'm frustrated. You guys are the worst and I'm tired. And, and there's a picture. Look at this picture. This is someone from Westboro Baptist Church who says this life-giving message. America's doomed. And this wasn't the worst one by any means. I just Googled it for images. And there's some with little kids holding signs that God hates, fill in the blank. God hates gays. God hates whatever. Just absolute terrible vitriol statements. And somehow these people think that they're Christians and they're just telling the truth. Hey, this is true. We need to repent. God is coming. Maybe America is doomed. I don't know. But I'm telling you, that is not the response we need to have to the world. Listen, you can, you can be right and still not be helpful. There may be some things where you're like, look, I am right. And you may be right. But if your rightness isn't helping people get to Jesus, you're still wrong. You're still wrong then. You can be right and still be wrong. <laughs> Ephesians 4.15 says, Therefore, speaking the truth in love so that others may grow into the fullness and to the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we speak the truth, but we do it in love. This isn't that. This isn't helping. But then there's another ditch that we fall into sometimes. And that's the, 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 the ditch of it's all good. It doesn't really matter. I mean, God loves everybody, everybody's welcome, and basically no one should have to change. I mean, come on, just, just come on in. God is love, it's good, and however you are, whatever you believe, it's great. Just come on, be part of our club. And here's a picture, this is, this is a generation. Love is 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 love. It doesn't matter, it's all good. I'm telling you, that's not truth. That's not our approach either, listen to me. There is an entire generation in America of young people who in the name of love are willing to lay aside the Bible as the truth of God's word. Are willing to just say, this isn't right. It's antique, it's ancient. God got it wrong. And in the name of love, they are somehow proclaiming that they love people more than God does. It, this is our generation. God is wrong because this can't be right and this isn't how we feel and this isn't lining up with, with our beliefs. And we've, 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 we've swung the pendulum so far that we're, we're not the ones who are changed by God's word. We're the ones who change God's word. And that's not the response. That's not, it's not what God asks us to do. The response for every single Christian to the arena of culture is a balance between Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Daniel knew that. 
Daniel didn't yell at the commander. He didn't say, we're not doing that. He talked. He had discord. He built relationship, and God gave him favor with the people around him. And he stood strong, and he stood firm. And Daniel did it, and Jesus Christ did it perfectly. Perfectly. John 1, verse 14 says this. The word became flesh, and it dwelt among us, Jesus. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus modeled the balance between grace and between truth. That it's not either or. It's both and. It's not we're right and you're wrong. It's also not, hey, everybody come in, you're fine. It's grace and it's truth. And you know how Jesus did it perfectly? Because he never sinned. He was perfect in his humanity, perfect in righteousness, never, ever compromised. And yet, the Bible says he hung around tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers and people accused him. You're the friend of sinners. He never compromised his stance and yet people who we would call sinners felt comfortable around him, felt like they could approach him, felt like he cared about them. Grace and truth is the answer to the culture around us. We need truth. You say, what's truth? Truth is God's standard. Truth is God's word. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them, O Lord, by your truth. Your word is truth. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Listen to me, church. We do not compromise the word of God or set it aside in order to be a part of culture or to be politically correct or to have people like us. We can't do that. Truth is still truth. And Jesus never did that. He never compromised. He never said it's fine. He never, no. Truth is still truth and we need truth. But we also need grace. We can't tell people, okay, this is the standard and when you get here, then you can be one of us. And when you get to this level, then you can hang out with us and you can come to church with us. But until then, you're over there and we're over here. No, the world needs to hear, yes, there's truth because without truth, we have no moral compass We have nothing to build our lives upon. We'd all follow the desires of our own heart. There needs to be truth, but there has to be grace that says, you're welcome here. Come in, be a part of God's family. Nothing you've done disqualifies you. Nowhere you've been erases you from the love of God. Grace, you say, what's grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. He loved you when you were unlovable. He died for you when you were enemies with him. And it's a gift. None of us can earn it. None of us are gonna say, well, I, I, I made it because I did enough good things. So you can't do anything too bad, but you also can't do anything too good. That's part of grace. You can't get baptized enough. You can't pray enough. You can't come to church enough to earn the love of God. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Is anyone writing this down? I feel like it could be a song. No? Never mind. Probably wouldn't work. Wouldn't be that popular. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. That's the grace of God. You can do nothing. So this is what grace and truth looks like. Listen, grace says, come as you are. Come as you are. You don't have to worry about cleaning yourself up. You don't have to worry about getting to a point where God's not too disgusted with you. No, wherever you're at, come. But the truth component says God loves you too much to let you stay there. God loves you exactly the way that you are. Broken, bent, off the Christian grid, whatever that looks like. But he loves you too much to say, okay, just stay there. It's fine. That's grace and truth. We come as we are. We can't listen. We can't have a church where we act like we're this Christian country club and all of us have it all together. And until you have it all together, you can't come in here. All of us have issues. Raise your hand if you have some issues in your life. Okay, there's a few of us. So don't feel bad about that. Some of us just got to the hospital before you did. But that's what the church needs to be. Full of grace and truth. Not not us shouting at the darkness. We're supposed to shine into the darkness. Not us saying, hey, you can't get in here until this happens. No, come as you are. But then the church has to be people who say, now grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be a part of what God's doing. 
Be a part of, of growing into who God says you are, not culture. It's, you can obey your feelings or you can obey God's word, but eventually the two aren't going to go the same path and you're going to have to choose. And that's what culture wants us to do, is compromise. And say, no, 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 this is okay. And you can be filled with grace and truth. And you can impact people around you like Jesus did. Do you want to know something? Do you know why people who carry picket signs that say repent or turn or burn or, or just yell at people on the streets to, to come to Christ, you know why they're not very effective? Have you ever seen one where hundreds of people said, you know what, I have been living far from God. And I'm really glad that you yelled that at me because now I feel like <laughs> I want to make a decision to know this God you're yelling about. Have you, no one's ever seen that. Because they're just angry and yelling. And do you know why it's not effective? Because coming to Christ and giving Jesus your life is a real decision that takes accountability. It takes people walking with you. It takes turning from something to God. And nobody wants to do that when a stranger just yells at them to. It takes relationship. But listen, here's my point. It's not going to happen if we're in here and everybody else is out there and we're never building bridges to reach people where they are. They're not our enemies. It takes relationship to bring people into the kingdom of God. It takes relationship. It takes love. It takes saying, I love you. It's okay. We don't feel the same. Not I'm affirming you. Not I think that's okay. But I love you. And I believe God has a plan for your life. And, and we start to build bridges that reach people. Grace and truth. I want to close with just one story and John chapter 8, and you've probably heard of it. It's the, it's the ultimate example of what I'm talking about. So the religious leaders, they want to trick Jesus. They want, to, they want to get him in a situation. So they take a woman who they say they caught in the act of adultery. They didn't take the man. I don't know why. Probably because of culture at the time, but obviously it takes two to tango. But they just picked on this woman, and they brought her naked and ashamed and dragged her in front of all of these people and in front of Jesus and said, we caught her. She's sinning. She's in adultery. The Bible says, the law says she has to be stoned. She has to be killed. What do you say? And I'm telling you, part of the test every one of us is going to face is culture and people we work with are going to point at us and say, what do you say? What's your stance? Who do you side with? And they were trying to trap Jesus. Is he going to say, yep, sorry, that's truth. We got to kill her. Or is he going to say, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's not her fault. And, and ignore the truth. That's what they wanted to see. And they wanted to trap Jesus. And the Bible says he would not respond to them. This woman standing there. And the Bible says that Jesus kneels down next to her and he begins to write in the dirt. And we don't know what he said, we don't know what he did, but I imagine maybe this woman is trembling. She's scared, she's ashamed. She's probably waiting maybe for the first stone to hit her. And Jesus may be just writing, it's okay. Your Redeemer's here. I love you. For you. Nothing you can do can separate me from your love. And then he stands up and he looks at her accusers and he says, if you're without sin, then you cast the first stone. And then he goes back down he begins writing in the dirt. And maybe these men were convicted of their sin. I don't know. Maybe there was a God moment where they saw through the lens of Jesus. But the Bible says one by one they began to leave, starting with the oldest. And Jesus kneels down to this woman. And he says, where are your accusers? Is there no one here who will condemn you? And she says, none. They're all gone. And Jesus looks at her and he says, neither do I condemn you. But then he didn't say, so now go back. Do whatever you want. I don't condemn you. He said, now go and leave your life of sin. He cared for her. He built a bridge of relationship with her. When they wanted to stone her, he defended her against the attacks of religious people who only wanted to see the plank in her, or the speck in her eyes and didn't see the plank in their own. Jesus did all of that first before he said, now go and leave your life of sin. And too often the church is trying to hurl truth bombs at the world and at culture and saying, leave your life of sin, you people. But Jesus didn't do that. He built a bridge. He showed that he cared. He honored her. And every time, listen, if you're in here 
and you're struggling and there's things you're dealing with in your life, I want you to know that Jesus is never going to shame you. He's never going to expose you. He didn't drag this woman and say anything while people were around. He was gentle and kind with her. And that's how our God addresses us. And that's how God's asked us to reach culture. We have to, have to, have to protect ourselves from the temptation of wanting to retaliate and be mean and be angry. They'll know your Jesus' disciples by your love. One for another. Grace and truth. It's how God responds to you and it's how God asks us to respond to the world. Will you guys stand up with me? I want to pray with you and we'll close. I just want you to bow your head and close your eyes and let the, the Spirit of God speak to you. What is God saying to you right now? Pastor Andrew said it's not a dialogue, it's a monologue and God is speaking. And maybe what he's saying to you is what he said to that woman. You don't have to fear. You don't have to be ashamed. Guilt doesn't define you. I'm here. I'm your redeemer. I'm your protector. I'm a strong tower. I love you. I'm for you. And I can take the broken pieces of your life and put them together if you'll let me, if you'll allow me access, if you'll surrender your life. God is real. His presence is real. And listen, it's the grace of God that says to every one of us, come as you are. Come, receive my love. Right now, you can't earn it. You don't need to pay for it. But it's the truth of God that sets us free. Grace and truth is in this place today. And it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you say, I need to give my heart to the Lord. I know I'm not right with God. I know I need Jesus to wash me and cleanse me and give me a new identity. I just want to pray with you. It's a real, real prayer that actually activates the heart of God. It's not just a religious thing we do. And if you're feeling that tug and you know today is the day you want your heart sealed with God forever, I want you to just raise your hand right now, boldly. Raise your hand. No one's looking around. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Leave your hand up. It's a new day. Awesome. Raise it high. Awesome. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Grace and truth is in this place. Grace and truth. I want everyone to repeat this prayer after me. Listen, if you mean it from your heart, the Bible says you confess with your heart or you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Listen, today is a brand new day for you. A brand new day in Jesus. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me when I was unlovable. Thank you for dying for me when I had nothing to give. I receive your grace. I receive your truth. I receive your love. I am a new creation. My past is gone. My future is sealed. Today, I am a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Come on. It's good. It's good. It's good. It never gets old. It never gets old. And listen, I'm going to ask the prayer team if they, if they would come forward. And, and before we dismiss, I just want to admonish you. The same grace that God shows you, he's asking us to show the world. And the same way that the love of God impacted your life, he wants to use you to reach culture, to reach our community, to see Kalamazoo and Southwest Michigan become a revival town because God's love, grace, and truth is pouring out on people and you're a part of it. Nobody is on the bench when it comes to the playbook of Jesus Christ. All of us have a part. And I wanna remind you that when you leave this place, you're not leaving Radiant Church, you're leaving as the church, the people of God, sent to be salt and light to the world around you. If you prayed that prayer, if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you, when everybody else is dismissed, come forward, let us pray with you. We have a book that we want to give you that will help you 10 steps towards Christ. Also, if you have anything that you need prayer for, this is the culture of Radiant Church. We want to believe God to move in your situation. So leave here. Hang out for the baptisms. It's going to be powerful. We have people that are getting identified with Jesus through baptism. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Happy 4th of July.